Back in 1997, Limp Bizkit would release their debut record $3 Bill Y'all, and while the record was a huge success, there were some markets that weren't as receptive to the band's music initially. This resulted in the band's label Interscope resorting to some new tactics to make inroads in these markets that also came with a fury of criticism. That's what we're going to discuss in today's video. Back in the 50s and 60s, a term known as payola soon came to light when it came out that record companies were paying radio DJs bribes to get their artist music played without publicly disclosing this. In 1997, Limp Bizkit's label Interscope reportedly paid $5,000 for 50 spins of Limp Bizkit's new single at the time, Counterfeit, over a span of five weeks. This payment method was the first of its kind known as pay for play. This payment was made to a Portland, Oregon radio station, KUFO 101.1, where the band was struggling to find an audience. What may surprise you is that it wasn't the label's idea, but the station's idea to try out a pay-for-play arrangement, with the station's operations manager telling the New York Times, the idea came out of wanting to be clear with the record labels on what we expect from each other and saying, hey, let's take a risk on breaking this band and sharing the rewards of its success. The first 150 spins of any record is a risk. You don't have a gauge on a song, we approached Interscope because we liked Limp Bizkit. It was one of their priority bands and we wanted to get some of the money away from print, he'd say. You may be asking yourself, so what's the difference between payola and pay for play? Well, Limp Bizkit's manager at the time would tell MTV the difference saying, this is honest, payola was about fraud. Payola was about DJs defrauding the owners of their stations and potentially hurting ratings by not making musical decisions. Then the FCC required people to say that a spin was paid for, so the fraud element was taken out of it. By us saying this is brought to you by Interscope, you know the money is going to the station. If stations want to make bad decisions, then the ratings go down, he'd say. And that's what supporters of pay for play would say. They would claim that the market would self-regulate itself. Before and after the song was played on the Portland station, an announcement came on stating, and I quote, brought to you by Flip Interscope. However, some critics would say that the wording was insufficient claiming it wasn't clear by the message that money was being exchanged for airplay, and the FCC could have fined the station upwards of $10,000 for each offense and imprisonment for up to a year or both, but it doesn't seem like any follow-up happened from the government. It wasn't just Interscope who was into the idea of pay-for-play as Capitol Records in Nashville at the time was also exploring paying a million dollars to radio to play spins of only their artists for one straight hour, while many radio stations considered doing similar arrangements. When the New York Times reached out to numerous record labels to comment on their position on pay for play, a lot of them didn't respond. But that's not to say all radio stations were receptive to the idea because some weren't. As the New York Times interviewed a fellow named John Sebastian, who was the program director for KZLA FM in LA, who said, I wouldn't do it and I think it's a dastardly idea. I may be idealistic in this day and age, but I think there are too many temptations for doing things the wrong way. There are all kinds of different ways to do the same thing through trips and dinners and showcases, but I don't play a song for any reason other than if it's good, he'd say. Critics of this practice allege that it was unethical and that unsigned bands or groups on smaller labels may not have the deep pockets or connections to get their music played on radio. At the 1997 South by Southwest conference, Spin Magazine editor-in-chief Michael Hershorn would state his opposition to the practice pointing to the limited availability of airtime on rock stations that are owned by big conglomerates like Clear Channel or CBS. Critics allege that the Federal Communications Commission or the FCC's deregulation of the industry contributed to radio stations having smaller playlists and making programmers less likely to take a chance on unknown acts. As for the pay for play trial in Oregon, it seemed to have been a success with Limp Bizkit's manager telling MTV the song is still on KUFO because the song is a hit. The album $3 Bill Y'all has sold 170,000 copies and Portland represents less than 1% of those sales. This just happens to be a brilliant move for everyone involved, the band, the station, and the label. The station gets airplay on a band for little cost, avoiding much more expensive promotions, and the band gets airplay in a market they normally wouldn't have, you'd say. As for pay for play, Rolling Stone would run an investigation in 2019 that showed it's still a pretty common practice, writing an article with the headline that read, nobody is scrutinizing this, how labels pay to get songs on the radio. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to hit the like button and subscribe, and we'll see you again on Rock and Roll True Stories. Take care.